Hi, my name is Alex Dolphin, and welcome back to another episode of Ex Ante. Today we're going to discuss the case of Papa v. Hayashi. This case was heard in the Superior Court of California in the year 2002. Let's go ahead and jump into the facts of the case. Both Papa and Hayashi went to a San Francisco Giants game in hopes of catching Barry Bonds' home run record-breaking ball. So Barry Bonds that this season was going to hit 73 home runs. Uh, this was a record-breaking event. And both Popov and Hayashi went to the Giants game in hopes of catching this ball. Um, lo and behold, in the first inning, Barry Bonds hit a bomb. Uh, and Popov was standing there with his glove. And the ball came and it hit his glove. That's where testimony is conf conflicted. But when it hit his glove... Uh, a swarm of people came around him in hopes of getting the ball for themselves. So they all kind of attacked Popov in hopes that if they were, you know, going to descend upon him, maybe they'd get the ball themselves. <clears throat> well, Hayashi also was hoping to get the ball, and he was he was attacked by the descending mob on Popov. Uh, so he was on the ground, and Hayashi was on the ground. Popov, uh, the ball hit his mitt, uh, eventually fell out and was on the ground. And Hayashi, while he was on the ground after being trampled, found this ball, grabbed it for himself, put it in his pocket and secured it. So Hayashi had the ball that Barry Bonds hit. It was a home run record breaking ball. Well, Popov um, felt like the ball was his. He felt like the ball was his because it first hit his mitt. So he brought a lawsuit against Hayashi claiming that uh, the ball was ultimately his property and he sued Hayashi for conversion along with trespass uh, to chattel. So that's the facts of the case. Um, the issue would be whose ball is it, right? Is it Popov's or Hayashi? And more broadly, um, is it is property ownership um, based upon first, you know, grasp or is it upon ultimate, um, you know, securement of that property? So that's the issue that the court had to wrestle with here. So now that we know the issue and the facts, go ahead and jump into the ruling of the court. The court um, didn't really know how to define property rights, so they commissioned a group of professors to go ahead and see if they could figure out whose property, who had the property rights to the ball. Uh, so they had a panel of professors that did this. Um, one of the professors was Professor Gray. He had a rule for property ownership um, of the ball that seems kind of intuitive to us. And it's that in a baseball game, if one wants to secure ownership of a ball, what they need to do is they need to hold that ball and have it in their corporeal possession. I mean, if it falls out of the mitt, like in this example for Popov, if it falls out of the mitt because of incidental contact. So say you're reaching for the ball and another person is reaching for the ball, the ball falls out of your mitt. Um, you don't have any property right claim to that ball. Ultimately it's the person who secures it fully. So. There's a couple of other conceptions of property, but the court does uh, accept Gray's rule in this case to be the rule that they're gonna apply to property rights. So that seems to be in favor of Hayashi. So the court kind of wrestles with that a little bit, but they also say that there's an important aspect to Popov um, being attacked when he tried to grab the ball. And because he was attacked, he didn't have full ability uh, because of the lawlessness of others to secure that ball for himself. So they found a middle ground. And the court ruled that there would be an equitable division of the property. So they ruled that both Popov and Hayashi would have a 50-50 claim to the property. So the ruling wasn't in favor of one or the other. It was in favor uh, of both men in the case, and they split the property rights to the ball. The ball sold for around $450,000, um, so they were able to split those proceeds. Um, cool. So that's the, that's the ruling of the case. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into some ex ante implications. The first one being that the court is likely going to um, adopt Gray's rule in the future for similar scenarios like this. I mean, you could envision other scenarios where a ball, maybe like a t-shirt, something goes off into the stands and whoever secures that fully is going to be the one with the property rights. Um, and they'll probably just adopt Gray's rule in the future. So the implications of the court adopting Gray's rule in this case are rather significant because it will be a precedent that can be called upon in the future. Um, I want to point out that the court says that they're not going to let lawlessness um, determine how they rule in this case. And in a sense, they are letting lawlessness uh, rule how they determine in this case, because um, Hayashi wouldn't have been on the ground and seen the ball if it weren't for the mob, just as Popov wouldn't have been able you know, to secure the ball if it weren't for the mob. So just as you know, Popov likely would have secured the ball without the mob surrounding him, 
Hayashi would have never seen the ball if it weren't for the mob that descended upon Papa because Hayashi wouldn't have been on the ground. Um, so lawlessness does dictate this case in a sense. Um, so I think that they're really only applying the lawlessness to Popov, not to Hayashi, because Hayashi was impacted by the lawlessness in a positive way. So that's something to think about. Um, also this conception of equitable division of property. If two people have um, competing and equal claims to that property, the court's allowed to do you know, an equitable division. That's something that is a nice tool for the court to have and for attorneys to have because it doesn't really have to be all or nothing. There can be a, a middle ground that can be found and folks can share the property rights. So thanks so much for watching and I hope you have a nice rest of your day. Bye.